This was me 26 years ago when I had black hair. I, I came into the States uh, in 1986 to join GE for what I thought was a two-year project to de develop a home of tomorrow for America. I thought it was an easy job because us Europeans have got all the ideas, we can do it. I was shocked how complex uh, the industry is. But th this is uh, not the typical Welsh home, but it's quite similar to many, you know, built with brick and stone and you heated it by turning the fire on in a room or turned it off when you didn't need it. And uh, I'll come full circle to that later on. But uh, I wanted to be an architect as a kid. I drew farmhouses and I so much wanted to be an architect. And then I got into product design and then I got into car design. So when I joined GE, I'd done a whole car of the future, an office of the future, and I thought this home of the future was a piece of cake. Came over to do it. Uh, so for me, it's no accident that every home looks like some kind of a car, some kind of a hybrid. And in 86, these kind of Pontiacs from the 70s and 80s, th these were the cars. And I'd argue that still today, many of the homes, certainly that not the newest, but most homes for me are cars like that. Heavy, drafty, gas guzzlers, uh, may not hold their value. Uh, you know, I'd put the ones on the bottom, the kind of cars that our home should be. The, the little Hyundai Veloster at the bottom, 40 plus mile per gallon, cool little car. You know, 10 year warranties are the new Tesla electric car. So for me, that's what I think of when I see a home. Uh, this was the G home we built, a um, couple of year program, but uh, stayed open for 15 more years. We had a lot of fun. I traveled the world of Germany, Scandinavia, Japan several times, borrowed from the best, stole like someone else said today. I'm not a building scientist. Uh, I think the smart thing is whatever there's a good idea, steal it. These are some of the dreams we had in the home. Uh, we talked much, and, and again, I was with GE's plastics business. So we wanted to try and improve the performance, first of the products, but I learned from my industrial design, it's systems thinking. So we showed a lot of systems and ideas, and uh, you look at some of the composite sidings and better windows, uh, insulation systems that have come on. We dreamed, like we talked last night with Tim, of advanced modular solar thermal and solar PV, and uh, you know, here. Uh, we had a little uh, image you see there of the touchscreen TV. I said, you know, they're gonna control your house with a $1,000 system one of these days. Well, that was 56 grand, and it was a room, like a great big closet, but we talked about the future, and it's here. Appliances, uh, high efficiency, plumbing modules. You see some of the home run plumbing systems, flat screen TV, home offices. And then our ultimate dream, we showed the big Lexus house, and I talked about the little Honda Civic, the thousand square foot. That was always my dream, the not so big. I think homes have become smaller now, and uh, we're on the way. There were a lot of dreams we had that we are still dreaming. They're not there yet. High performance, electrochromic, uh, maybe windows with uh, high performance glazing systems, raceways that would run around the base of every uh, room where walls could snap in and be smart. Uh, home health monitoring. I'll touch on that because I think we're really getting close and indoor air quality. Plumbing modules that would be, we see a labor issue then, we still have it now, snap together pieces and parts. And the big kahuna of all, a dream of the total environmental control prototype we built that will really control with sensors your whole uh, indoor air quality. And not yet, but we'll touch on that. So when we set up Ibicos as an outgrowth, we carried on the dream. We still dream of net zero energy homes and communities. We know it will take a long while for that to become standard, but that's where you strive for. Um, so we've been partnering with DOE forever. They've funded a lot of the research we've done. And everything we do, we think systems. So I, I hope I connect some of the dots from today's presentation. But we have gone after the whole house integration. You couldn't design a car by looking at the pieces. You could, it would never drive. 
Uh, you have to integrate them. Uh, we still don't have full design integration in housing. Part of that comes because the people who design them, the architects, often don't design them. The builder is designing them. The production builder is not really using architects to the level they should be. So we've taken this on as our challenge. The production builder is our target. The other thing I found that as a dreamer in the 80s, 90s, I thought it was a technology problem. It's not a technology problem. It's a business problem. And the whole processes that go on from when a builder plans a community, designs it, specifies it, builds it, markets that value to the buyer, that's where the uh, issue is and the opportunity. Uh, interesting to look where the standards have gone over the years, you know, with the 2006 IECC base, you know, line. That was a lot of our work through the 90s, you know. Uh, DOE funded a lot of it. Great, fantastic. What Sam and the EPA team raising those standards and showcasing uh, better ways. The new code now as we look to 30 and then 50, you know, higher standards. The challenge is most builders today are having trouble bringing things like uh, ducts in condition, condition spaces. Never mind what they're going to face as they get to 50%. But we want to keep driving them higher. You know, most homes in the country are in the top of that HERS chart, 50% worse than a typical code home. Uh, we dream with Energy Star and then what uh, the minimum we heard from Ed, 50% up in energy efficiency in what Architecture 30, 2030 wants. Uh, passive house nearly to zero and then net zero. So we still got to keep reaching higher. So what's coming? Big crash, shocked us all the last four or five years, but uh, we think the home of tomorrow, uh, I don't advocate the design of homes. I'm a big believer, a member of Congress for New Urbanism, and ULI forever, uh, big advocate for community design. I think the hybrid of the future is part contemporary, part traditional. But these are the values that we're seeing now are gonna win. Smaller homes, definitely energy and water, much comfort, they're still going to be familiar. Um, again, you get a lot of communities that I think the production builders will build. You go, whoa, um, get rid of the garage. Uh, but uh, what we've looked at, and many smart people before me have done a phenomenal job at the, the thermal enclosure of the house. And I think we've made great strides in that. And. Uh, Maybe a few more to go, but that's where we don't. We think that will carry on getting better, but I'm going to touch on some areas that really complement that. But uh, we're a believer in passive house. We're a believer in tightening the house and ventilating it well. Uh, we had some discussion last night uh, with Tim. I think it's fantastic what some natural ventilation approaches in Europe do. Um, but we look in this country, is so big that a lot of parts where you've got to condition that air. So we are believers in tightening it up and then condition it. Uh, on this particular shell of the home that we built in Pittsburgh, and we kept that lab home there for a couple of years, uh, we used a two by, an eight inch wall with two by fours, staggered studs. Uh, worked with a factory producer who panelized it, and they loved it. We're not only advocating this, we love the idea of SIPs panels. We love the idea of ICFs. Again, we don't advocate a system. It's help the builder create the best kit of parts. Peter just touched on it. Much of our work is on risk management when we look at what the builder faces when he doesn't handle the design of the house and the whole HVAC and how you take moisture out. You tighten the shell of a home, it's not naturally going to dry anymore. It's at times going to rot. It's going to create real indoor air quality issues, major risk issues. The biggest thing we see, though, is your typical ducts and your heating and cooling systems, they don't work at the same level they did when the house naturally leaked. So I'm going to talk about the areas where we think there are great potential, the whole ventilation, the distribution of air through housing, things like energy recovery ventilators and what they can be to heat and cool the house. 
you first look at this chart, look at uh, you know the benchmark house from Building America on the left, the typical you know home. Half the energy in that is in space heating. Now, particular house, you can see where the orange came down to almost nothing. Again, how much air now passes through typically your uh, your ducts. Uh, the next big challenge we also hit on today was the hot water. You can see how that. Uh, pie stays quite big, 57 goes still to 17, so that's a challenge. But probably the greatest, the miscellaneous electric loads, the appliances, the lighting. Look at the size of the green there, of the pie that's still left. So once we master the shell with better windows, we've now got to go on those vampire loads and the appliances, maybe new standards. So just like to touch on a couple of areas that we are focusing on and we think is the next great challenge of uh, improvement as we look to 2020. Maybe as Emery Lovins uh, talked to my partner several years ago, maybe we get rid of ducts. If you really can tighten that shell home of the house so good, do you need ducts? And if you do need ducts, a lot of our work is looking at polymer-based, snap together. The codes don't allow them yet. But like that car again, sensors throughout the home, air pass through high velocity, maybe higher in the room, mix in well. So either get rid of them or reduce them incredibly uh, small. The next, looking at where the ERV can go. And we're seeing today that manufacturers are crossing. We work closely with Panasonic, who have, again, great systems to ventilate the home. So we be big believers in uh, balanced ventilation. But like an ERV, you can now, you could have that condition, the moisture, indoor air quality, sensors in the rooms, uh, really condition the whole space. And we're looking at little heating and cooling units that could be snapped into those. So that dream of that system I showed you earlier may actually come. Um, but will it be Carrier or Panasonic or who goes after those systems? So that's the next challenge. You've seen a lot around the world of the mini splits. You know, as homes do become smaller, more urban, more walkable, like Chris said, uh, we're looking at one or two points sources for sending air into the home. In that particular lab home, we complemented it with a, a jump duct registered above the doors with a little fan in that basically helped pull the con conditioned air into that bedroom and then returned it. Um, so we think great strides here. For us, this is the next uh, challenge and, and what's taking a lot, of, uh, a lot of our work. Added to that, we think there's great potential in home energy management systems. They haven't achieved their potential yet. They're new. Uh, they've still got a long way to go. Uh, but you can start thinking again, like my car will sense the, the comfort in the front and back seats and then change what air it gives us accordingly. This is our dream for the home, those sensors riddled through a house, invisible like a car. A car is a driving computer. It might just look cool, but it's a computer. So can a house be. Uh, you can start linking these and control the IAQ, the moisture, the total comfort. So again, it's almost where smart meets comfort. And if smart grid does you know, reach its uh, uh, what we'd all hope for. The homes are just the smart end nodes. A couple of uh, opportunities we see in this, and a uh, couple of shots here. One actually from Panasonic. They're involved with a consortium in Japan, F Fujisawa, doing a complete smart, sustainable town. It's fantastic. And uh, I just showed you GE's and Panasonic's home energy management system. What they dream there is the complete enchilada, so to speak, the control of the home, the appliances, the lighting, telling you when you're best to do your washing and drying, depending on uh, loads. And then what GE's doing uh, with Masco in Lake Nona is quite interesting. Uh, a healthy community, that they're, they're not raising the bar so high, 20% energy, 20% uh, water reduction, 20% emissions, but still, it's a good bar. Uh, but that whole health I talked about, how the home can start monitoring your health. And as we age, uh, who made the point today, we can't keep 
putting the uh, last six months of your life into uh, health costs. So the home will be smarter, it will manage health, it will have indoor air quality. Not going to be easy to get there, but uh, it'll be better. Many of the builders we work with uh, in the Building America research are already raising the bar. I think they've got a great opportunity. Um, the home almost does become the car, the mile per gallon. The HERS rating there, where are you? I'm a 56, I'm a 42. It's quite a tangible metric. And the only way you'll achieve that performance at less risk is carry on looking at the house as a complete uh, system, a total solution. So for the builder, I think they are now, uh, many of our builders have differentiated the last two or three years uh, from the, the old home or the lower performance builder and outsold them three to one at times. Uh, Sam and I have the same dream. I stole this slide when, a couple of years ago when I found this. If the home isn't a car, well, maybe the car company is a home company. So uh, I've been around Panasonic's uh, factory, uh, Panahome in Japan a couple of times. I've been around Toyota's home company, but a couple of other big groups. Uh, you know, these homes, modular, I just love the 60-year warranty, so, you know? I used to joke in 86 to 90 when I was on this bandwagon with the GE home. Why does a home not have a manual? At that point, GE's clock radio for 50 bucks came with a manual. <laughs> Your house didn't, you know. So this is our dream and we'll keep fighting uh, till it's there. Before I end and touch on a couple of uh, barriers, I uh, just wanted to also touch on work that we're doing that uh, uh, is looking at the shell, the external shell of uh, existing homes, 120 million homes or so. We're working with NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research Group, funded by DOE, to look at what a, a deep retrofit new shell might be where you clad an old house. That's one step, and then the next step is what's the heart and lung system of that, that doesn't create indoor issues. So uh, that's other research needs to be done. Uh, Rick asked us for a few barriers. Uh, we think building science understanding is a fundamental barrier still. Not te teaching it enough in the architecture schools anymore. The builder doesn't have anyone on his team that understands it. Uh, th there are not many Jacob Batalas in our industry at the production builder level, which is a crime. Uh, thank God they use the Mark Le Libertés and others to teach them uh, what, but there's not enough building science understanding. There isn't enough building science understanding in the manufacturers. We work with many of them and they know their widget well, but how their widget links to the complete system, there's a, there's a hole there. So there was a nice challenge to become the, from Peter the complete system. Um, and the code officials, a lot of the codes uh, thank God a lot of the building scientists that we're part of are helping them, but they don't understand the science. Design integration tool. I think you've seen a nice growth in visualization tools, some good energy modeling, the woofies of the world. Uh, BIM is starting to come. We think a challenge of how you put all those together so the expert system can help look at those flaws in the, how the systems fit together. The status quo. A lot of builders, I think, don't realize times have changed. My old boss at GE said we all, when a press person asked him, uh, what's affordable housing? He said, it's the home for all of us. We can't, it was German. We cannot afford a custom-built home anymore. We don't buy custom clothes, custom jewelry, custom anything. And he was right, I think, you know, the move towards uh, more value-driven, cost-effective housing is going to be a challenge because salaries won't keep going up. So the builder's got to change. Um, and lastly, uh, on the business side, a real issue is the geographic scale. As a Brit coming you know, from that little country, it's not hard for the government to set standards. And Germans the same, big country, but still not America. Japan is tiny. Uh, 3,000 miles square is America. Uh, for the, invest, you know, the manufacturers to invest in plants and equipment 
or for housing companies to invest in more modular housing, you better have a 100 or 150 mile radius to pay that home back. Uh, but there's some headway coming. The, uh, some of the cool, like Michelle Kaufman and some of the modular home producers are, are getting there. So I think the challenges can be overcome. Uh, I'm excited what this group's about. We profess for years we're not in competition. The competition out there is poor performance. You know, we've all got to work together, and I think uh, I really do take my hat off to DOE. They could, we could, as Ibicus, never have done the research without part of their funding. Industry funds it too, but the amount of investment in R&D and systems approaches in this country is less than one tenth of one percent compared to you know the Danes, the Germans, the Japanese, and so. Uh, uh, we're all in it together. I'm proud to be part of it, and I'm happy to be here today, and thank you.